Now's the chance. <laughs> In the circus world where reality meets the bizarre, some circus freaks actually existed. Uncover. These extraordinary individuals defied the norms, captivating audiences with their unique talents and appearances. Join us on a journey through history's most fascinating sideshow spectacles, where each performer had a story as extraordinary as their acts. Number 10. The Siamese Twins. In the captivating realm of circus freaks that actually existed, our first story today is about the extraordinary Chang and Eng Bunker. Hailing from a quaint Thai fishing village in 1811, these Siamese twins were a spectacle of nature, their bodies connected by a mere 15-centimeter band of flesh and cartilage at the sternum, rendering surgical separation an impossibility due to their fused livers. Discovered by the inquisitive British merchant Robert Hunter, at the tender age of 17, the twins were thrust into the limelight, captivating audiences across America and Europe. Known as the Siamese Double Boys, their unique physicality and uncanny coordination fascinated crowds, turning them into a sensation. Yet beyond their anatomical novelty, Chang and Eng proved to be savvy self-promoters, seizing control of their act and earnings. By 1839, the twins not only made a lot of money but also became official Americans. They stopped performing and chose to live on a farm in North Carolina calling themselves the Bunker family. Their post-circus life was nothing short of intriguing. The brothers, known for their unique bond, embarked on an unconventional journey of living separately yet together. Each of them got married and built their own houses, establishing a distinctive routine of alternating three-day stays. Initially, this lifestyle raised eyebrows, but it turned out to be a harmonious arrangement that worked seamlessly for the brothers. Settling into this peculiar lifestyle, Chang and Eng flourished in their adopted North Carolina home. Their union not only brought personal happiness, but also contributed to the growth of an extraordinary family. The brothers became fathers to an astonishing 21 children, playing a significant role in forming one of the largest extended families in their county. The brothers faced problems during the Civil War, so they returned to Barnum's show. But after the war, they didn't make much money. They thought about getting separated. And in 1871, Chang had a stroke, which made their health worse. Chang died in 1874 because of a clot in his brain. Eng, always worried, passed away a few hours later from fright. They were buried at White Plains Baptist Church in Surrey County. Number nine, the camel girl. Back in 1886, a young woman named Ella Harper burst onto the New York City circus scene, turning heads with her extraordinary and rare condition. Her knees curved outward, making her walk on all fours like a camel. Known as the Camel Girl, Ella's unique act quickly became a hit, drawing massive crowds eager to witness her astonishing acrobatic skills. Ella was born on January 5, 1870, in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Her dad, William Harper, was a well-known farmer. Ella had a twin brother, Everett, who sadly passed away when he was only three months old. She also had three more siblings, Salia, Willie, and Jesse. In 1882, at just 12 years old, Ella started performing in the circus. She began in places like St. Louis and New Orleans, and soon she traveled to different states. People became really interested in Ella because of her special way of walking. By 1886, Ella joined the Nickel Plate Circus, thanks to showman W.H. Harris. During her performances, she was accompanied by a camel, and people were amazed by the comparison between her knees and the camel's. They started calling her the Camel Girl, thinking she was part human and part camel. Ella became really famous because of her unique talents, and you could see her face on lots of cool posters. Before she did her shows, they handed out cards to the audience with info about her special condition. These cards showed Ella's life as the camel girl, with pictures of her knees bending backwards and her doing this cool thing where she walked on all fours using both her hands and feet. They spilt the secret that she had been touring for four years, impressing people everywhere. But here's the big shocker. Ella Harper, the camel girl, said goodbye to the circus in 1886. 
Why did she leave so suddenly? Well, Ella had bigger plans than just performing in the circus. She wanted to go to school. She asked people to see her show before she left. The cards also spilt that she was making a good $200 every week, which was a lot back then, like $5,000 today. In a surprising turn, when Ella was only 16, she decided to leave the circus and focus on learning. 1886 was the end of her circus days and she used her money to lead a private life, leaving everyone curious about where she went. Number eight, Elephant Man. I am not an animal, I am a human being, I am a man. These powerful words, though delivered by John Hurt in the portrayal of the Elephant Man in a David Lynch film, capture the essence of Joseph Merrick's struggle. Born into a slum in 1862, Joseph Carey Merrick's life took a dark turn early on. Strange swellings emerged around his mouth by age two, spreading across his face like the rough, lumpy skin of an elephant. At five, more odd symptoms appeared, and a damaging fall at eight left him permanently disabled and disfigured. Losing his brother at eight and his mother at 11 marked Merrick's life with profound sadness. Orphaned and unloved, he faced taunts and hunger. By 15, brutalized by his father, he left home and entered a workhouse that resembled a prison. Merrick, heavily disfigured, found himself thrust into the freak show circuit for survival. Escaping the workhouse in his native East Midlands after his mother's tragic death, Merrick toured his hometown before making his way to London in 1884. Displayed in a penny gaff sideshow, he drew crowds from all walks of life, ranging from street drunks to Princess Alexandra. Merrick's congenital deformities caught the attention of surgeon Frederick Trevis, who invited him to be photographed for medical records. As the Victorian era's fascination with freak shows waned toward the late 19th century, Merrick's journey took him across Europe after the closure of penny gaff shops. Robbed and abandoned in Belgium, a penniless Merrick somehow made his way back to Britain despite his deteriorating condition, hindering his ability to communicate. Unable to express himself clearly to the police, a card with Treves' name was discovered, leading the surgeon to take Merrick in at the hospital. It was there that Merrick spent the rest of his life, trapped in a tragic cycle that took him from the harsh world of the freak show to a place of refuge unable to escape the clutches of his debilitating condition. Number seven, the bearded lady. In the world of circus freaks, the bearded lady always stands out. And Annie Jones, the bearded lady from PT, Barnum's famous circus was a real star. Born in 1865 in Virginia, Annie surprised everyone by having a beard on her chin right from the start. Annie's parents, instead of being upset, saw this as a special opportunity. Before she was even one year old, Annie was part of P.T. Barnum's show in New York City, known as the Infant Esau, referencing a hairy character from the Bible. Described as an extraordinary example of a hairy person, Annie's journey in showbiz began before she could even walk, and Barnum offered her mom a three-year contract for $150. Annie's career didn't end with that contract. She went from being the infant Esau to the Esau lady and finally became the famous bearded lady. To charm the audience, Annie embraced both her feminine side and her facial hair. She wore stylish feminine clothes and even learned to play the mandolin, creating a captivating mix that made her one of Barnum's most unforgettable acts. Annie Jones, the famed bearded lady from PT, Barnum's circus left an indelible mark on the sideshow scene. Born in 1865 with a beard, likely due to her suitism, she became the most renowned bearded lady of her time. Yet she wasn't alone. Julia Pastrana, known as the Ape Woman, shared the spotlight. Married at 15 to sideshow Barker Richard Elliott, their union lasted 15 years, facing parental disapproval. After a divorce in 1895, Jones remarried William Donovan, touring Europe together until his sudden death. Despite her fame, Jones challenged the term freak, advocating for respect. Sadly, she succumbed to tuberculosis at 37. If you met her on the street, do you think you would ask for a selfie? Number six, Lobster Boy. In 1937, Pittsburgh witnessed the arrival of a unique talent, Grady Stiles Jr. 
born with the rare condition ectrodactyly, giving his hands the appearance of lobster claws. The Stiles family's history with this condition dates back to 1840. Grady Sr., a sideshow performer himself, saw an opportunity in his son's condition and incorporated him into the act at just seven years old. Despite the challenges, young Grady, with his astounding upper body strength, embraced the sideshow life, captivating audiences across the country. In the twisted world of carnival sideshows, Grady Stiles, born with ectrodactyly in 1937, transformed into the Lobster Boy. His rare deformity, resembling lobster claws, marked the beginning of a life entwined with love and tragedy. As part of the Stiles family legacy spanning 130 years, Grady embraced his carnival existence in Gibsonton, Florida. Despite his physical challenges, he reveled in the carnival atmosphere from his wheelchair, proudly declaring himself the Lobster Boy. Love found Grady when he married Maria Teresa Herzog, a fellow carnival worker. Their union resulted in two children, both inheriting ectrodactyly. However, the joyous carnival life gradually turned dark. Succumbing to alcoholism, Grady's love morphed into anger, leading to a beastly transformation. His abusive tendencies escalated, especially towards his family. Despite his once successful career, financial struggles intensified his cruelty, making him unleash torment upon his wife and children. Grady Stiles Jr., known for drinking a lot and smoking heavily, was also known for being mean to people, both with his words and actions. In 1978, something terrible happened. On the night before his oldest daughter's wedding in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Grady Stiles Jr. shot and killed his daughter's fiance. In the trial the next year, he admitted to doing it, but he didn't go to jail. Instead, he got 15 years of probation because no prison in Pennsylvania could handle someone with his unique hand condition. The story didn't end there. In November 1992, when Stiles Jr. was 55, a 17-year-old sideshow performer named Chris Wyant shot and killed him. It's said that Maria, Stiles' wife and her son from another marriage hired Wyant to do it. This marked the sad and shocking end of Lobster Boy's unusual and troubled life. But do you think he got what he deserved? Or was he also a victim? Number five. Jojo the Dog-Faced Boy In the 19th century, Fedor Jeftichu faced an unusual fate due to his rare genetic condition called hypertrichosis, which covered his face and body in a fine layer of hair. Exploited by a circus producer, Fedor was dubbed Jojo the Dog-Faced Boy, a name that stuck in the media. Back then, hypertrichosis had no scientific explanation, and people believed it was a sign of atavism bringing individuals closer to animals. Adrian Jeftichu, married with two children, was another hairy spectacle, drawing attention from Moscow anthropologists. Adrian's unique appearance led to an unexpected partnership with Fedor, another hypertrichosis sufferer. Billed as father and son, they became a sensation at local fairs. Adrian adopted Fedor, taking him under his wing, and their duo flourished attracting the attention of an entrepreneur. In 1883, the Jeftichus embarked on a world tour, captivating European audiences in Paris and Berlin. Adrian, embracing his newfound fame, made diva-like demands in their contracts. However, he succumbed to alcoholism, leaving Fedor to carry on alone. Fedor's journey continued when Phineas Barnum, a famous US businessman, invited him to join his circus. Now known as Jojo, Fedor became a star in The Greatest Show on Earth. His fame spread across America, with a Kentucky newspaper hailing him as one of the most interesting freaks alive in 1886. Jojo, the dog-faced boy, was the star of P.T. Barnum's show, but behind the scenes, there was a made-up story to make him even more interesting. They said he was found in a Russian forest living with a wolf-like father and tamed by Barnum. Jojo would growl, show his teeth, and even chew raw meat for the audience. However, the real Jojo was different from the act. He was a polite, educated, and humble person. He enjoyed languages and reading. Contrary to the show's story, he never had a family of his own. 
After performing for almost 20 years, Jojo started feeling homesick. He sent letters to the Russian consulate to find out about his mother. But Barnum, wanting to keep his star, didn't let him stop performing. Jojo had no choice but to keep going. In 1903, while touring in Greece, Jojo got sick with pneumonia and passed away. The man who fascinated crowds with his unusual appearance and the fictional tale of his past had a tragic end. The bright lights that once showcased Jojo's life in the circus faded away, marking the end of his unique journey. Number 4. The Skeleton Man Isaac, born on May 21, 1841, seemed like a healthy child, but at 12 he began an unusual journey. Rapid weight loss puzzled his parents, and despite seeking help from numerous doctors across Massachusetts and beyond, the mysterious illness remained unidentified. By 18, the weight loss halted, leaving Isaac at a mere 19 kilograms, standing at 1.67 meters. Tragedy struck at 19 when both parents succumbed to illnesses, leaving Isaac alone. Faced with the harsh reality of life, he attempted various jobs to sustain himself. However, his frail body struggled with the demands of intense labor. Isaac's struggle for survival unveils a tale of resilience against an unidentified force that transformed him from a healthy child into the skeletal man he became. In 1865, Isaac's path crossed with P.T. Barnum, the entertainment mogul who owned a museum dedicated to the bazaar. Persuaded by Barnum, Isaac signed a contract for a whopping $80 per week, equivalent to $1,320 today. While the pay was good, enduring constant ridicule was the price he paid for being part of the peculiar show. Surrounded by a cast of special individuals, from bearded women to giants and dwarfs, Isaac stood out as the Living Skeleton, a nickname bestowed upon him by Barnum. The shows were a hit, attracting audiences from all over the United States. However, tragedy struck in 1868 when the venue caught fire, nearly claiming everyone's lives. Miraculously, Isaac's slender frame helped him escape the flames, marking a turning point in his extraordinary journey through the world of showbiz. Taking a hiatus in 1870, Isaac found love in Tamar Moore, tying the knot and welcoming three healthy children. Concerned about passing on his condition, Isaac was relieved that his offspring remained unaffected. However, family responsibilities beckoned, leading Isaac back to the world of freak shows. Reconnecting with Barnum, Isaac embarked on a global tour, showcasing his unique physique in Canada, Great Britain, and various European nations. Unfortunately, the allure of gambling consumed much of his earnings during these travels. In 1882, at 41, Isaac received a grim diagnosis of severe muscle atrophy, a consequence of his lifelong condition. Despite the challenges, his popularity prompted Harvard Medical School to offer $1,000, which is about $26,065 today, for the study of his body posthumously. Isaac's journey continued to captivate audiences worldwide, leaving an indelible mark on the circus landscape. Number 3. The Three-Legged Man Francesco Lentini, born in 1889 in Sicily, wasn't just a sideshow act. He was a man with an extraordinary story. Billed as the man with three legs, Lentini, in fact, had four feet, three legs, 16 toes, and two sets of functioning male genitals. To add a touch of complexity, each of his legs was of a different length. In 1898, at the tender age of eight, Lentini arrived in America and instantly became a sensation. Audiences were captivated, not just by his unique physique, but also by his sharp wit and sense of humor. Lentini's agility was particularly astounding. He could skillfully kick a soccer ball with his extraordinary limb, showcasing a level of control that left crowds amazed. As Lentini matured, his performances shifted focus, highlighting his charming character. Using his extra limb as a stool, he conducted interviews, answering questions that ranged from his innocent hobbies to the intricacies of his personal life. An often asked question was about his shoes. 
to which he humorously replied that he bought two pairs and generously gifted the extra one to a one-legged friend. Amidst the limelight, Lentini found love, Teresa Murray became his wife, and together they raised four healthy children. Lentini's career spanned over 40 years, working with renowned circuses and sideshows, including Barnum & Bailey and Coney Island. In the late 1930s, people started seeing those with unique features differently. They were no longer just entertainment. Laws were made against showing deformed human beings. By 1950, sideshows were fading away, with people wanting performers to be treated better. But not everyone agreed like Frank Lentini. He believed performing was often the only way to make a living. In 1926, Frank and Teresa Lentini bought a place in Wethersfield, Connecticut. By 1930, they were listed as residents, and Frank's job was as a circus performer. This move wasn't part of a bigger immigration trend. It was unique. In a changing world, Frank's family found a home on Brimfield Road, a place where their house, finished in 1930, stood out in a growing town. Despite societal changes, Frank embraced his role as a circus performer in a city where extraordinary and ordinary mixed. His enduring impact earned him the affectionate nickname The King among his peers. Lentini continued to tour until his passing at the age of 78 in 1966, leaving behind a legacy that transcended the circus tent. Number 2. General Tom Thumb In the 17th century, the tale of Tom Thumb, a boy as tiny as his father's thumb, was pure fantasy. Fast forward to the 19th century, and P.T. Barnum turned this fantasy into reality when he stumbled upon Charles Stratton, making him the unforgettable General Tom Thumb. Born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, to regular-sized parents on January 4, 1838, Charles seemed like an ordinary child until he hit six months. At that point, he stopped growing, topping out at 25 inches tall and 15 pounds. By age four, he hadn't added an extra inch. The turning point came in 1842 during a winter storm that stranded P.T. Barnum in Bridgeport. Having just opened Barnum's American Museum in New York City, Barnum was on the lookout for unique attractions. Hearing about Stratton, he saw an opportunity. Barnum, who would later gain fame for his circus, proposed to showcase little Charles at his museum for the hefty sum of $3 per week. This chance meeting marked the beginning of General Tom Thumb's incredible journey from an ordinary Connecticut boy to a worldwide sensation. Barnum, the legendary showman, named him after the English fairy tale but added a touch of grandeur with the title General. Barnum spun a captivating tale claiming Stratton hailed from England, brought to America at great expense at the age of 11. This fictional backstory enhanced the intrigue surrounding the pint-sized performer. Recognizing the potential in the charming young boy, Barnum became a mentor, teaching him comedy routines. Stratton, soon surpassing his teacher in improvisational flair, embarked on tours across the United States. Audiences, expecting to pity the man in miniature, were instead enchanted by his humor and charm. The duo even toured Europe, where Stratton's Napoleon impersonation became a cultural sensation, mimicked by lesser talents for years. A command performance for Queen Victoria brought them fame and fortune. Back in America, Charles invested in real estate in East Bridgeport, building a house tailored to his unique size. His fame reached the White House, where he performed for President Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Meanwhile, Barnum added another act to his circus, Lavinia Warren Bump, a 32-inch high woman. Charles, smitten, wooed, and married her in a grand event that captivated the nation. The newlyweds embarked on a three-year working honeymoon, entertaining audiences worldwide. By the time they returned to Bridgeport, Charles had performed in front of more people than anyone in history before the television era. From a poor Bridgeport kid, he had turned what many saw as a disadvantage into a remarkable achievement. Sailing yachts, breeding thoroughbreds, and mingling with the most famous people of his time. Number 1. The Human Worm In the dazzling world of circus oddities, few performers were as enigmatic as Prince Randian, 
known by a myriad of names, including the snake man, the human torso, and the human caterpillar. Yet, regardless of the alias, when the curtain lifted and the spotlight beamed upon him, audiences were in for an unexpected spectacle. At just under three feet tall, Prince Randian was a startling vision. His arms were mere nubs terminating at the shoulders, and his legs were almost absent. Clad in a one-piece red and white striped suit, he more closely resembled a human caterpillar than a man. Indeed, his sideshow impresario, P.T. Barnum, skillfully exploited this peculiar appearance. Throughout his sideshow career, Prince Randian captivated audiences by gracefully wiggling across the stage, performing astonishing tricks using only his mouth. Barnum, a master showman, recognized the allure of the extraordinary. Stripped of conventional limbs, Randian defied expectations, becoming a sensation that left audiences simultaneously amazed and perplexed. Barnum, the circus maestro, portrayed Randian as a Hindu, fluent in Hindi, English, French, and German. Despite his unusual appearance, Randian led a surprisingly ordinary life. Before his circus days, he married Princess Sarah, also a Hindu, and together they raised four children, Mary, Elizabeth, Wilhelmina, and Richard. As Randian embarked on his U.S. journey, his family joined the adventure. Settling in Plainfield, New Jersey at the end of the 19th century, they created a peaceful home base while Randian wowed audiences under the big top. And so we've seen it, these special individuals that ruled the circus show in the 19th and 20th century. While some did it out of free will and others were exploited, we can't help but wonder what it was like in these shows. Thanks for watching till the end. Remember to like and share this video if you enjoyed it. See you on the next one. Bye for now.